<laughs> What's going on, everyone? All right, we're live again. It is Thursday night, April 22nd, 2021. How's it going? I'm Jay, and here's your host again for another week of say, coffee and cigars, where we're going to be tasting coffee and tasting cigars, as the name is said. So in today's lineup, we're going to be doing the War Witch Robusto from Black Line Cigars, as well as tasting a new coffee that I have that I'd ordered up to, uh, to try. And I feel like the song is kind of long. All right, all right, all right. So, again, thanks for tuning in. Welcome to the show. Appreciate you spending another Thursday night here with me. This is episode number 39 of all things. 39 weeks of doing this and still not getting it smooth enough. <laughs> so how's everyone doing? What are you guys doing out there? You know, drop your name and drop your uh, comments and drop your cigars and your drinks in the comments and where you're smoking. It's a little bit chilly here in Baltimore. It's getting a little bit cold again. Tonight we're having frost warnings from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., I think it is. Frost. It's almost the end of April, and we're still having frost. We just had this whole spell of, like, kind of warm weather, and now we're going to frost again. So it's a little bit uh, troubling in that respect. But, you know, all right. So we're going to move right into the show, as always. And today for the coffee, I thought we'd try something different. Last week, if you remember in our mailbag segment, we had um, we'd received some coffees from one of the importers. And... You know, this is a coffee that I don't normally buy, right? So there's there's spectrums of coffee, right? So if we if we're talking about grading coffee on a scale of zero to one hundred, and especially coffees eighty and above, you know, most of the coffees that I deal with are in eighty and above, and I don't really look at coffees in the in the premium or or uh, commercial categories of coffee. So. I thought it'd be interesting to get some samples of more premium type of coffees. So I've got this coffee here. As you can see, I roasted up a little bit. You can see some variations in the color, right? Slight variations in the roast coat color. That's probably because uh, the way that it's, it's actually harvested and processed. So what this is, this is a, a coffee from Brazil. And this Brazilian coffee is what we call a New York 2-3 category. So the Green Coffee Association actually sets different categories for acceptable number of defects in a sample. And this particular coffee is a New York 2-3 with a 1718 alpha. And what, that, what does that mean? That means that it has, the 2-3 two two means the number of acceptable defects. So this will allow you to have um, what is it? It would allow us to have maximum of nine secondary defects and no primary defects. And primary defects are like things that are really, really troubling for a coffee, what we call blacks, partial blacks, um, foreign matter, things like that, um, even like taints, like if, if there could be like diesel taints to it. So those would be heavy duty, what we call primary defects, and those would disqualify coffee from being for sure for being specially, but also would take it out of the the New York 2-3. And why New York 2-3? New York because the the C exchange, the, the commodities exchange for coffee is based out of New York. So, and then the 1718 means that these are size 1718 beans because they will not fit through a 1416 screen. And so what that means is that these are, these are screen numbers used for sorting coffees that will uh, just separate them out so that so that you know as a buyer they have a certain amount of defects that are acceptable as well as a certain size so different coffee companies will have different purposes for that so this kind of coffee most people are buying not necessarily not necessarily for the the actual taste but they could be using this coffee for other purposes um, to meet whatever production 
requirements they have. Okay, so what they say about this coffee, this is a, a Brazilian coffee, so we'll push this up again. again. It's from the Cerrado Mineiro region, which is kind of, I, I think in, well, I don't know where it is. It's in Brazil, but I mean, I don't know what part of Brazil. I should have looked that up. And if this comes from about 1,200 meters. It's a natural processed coffee, which means that the coffee is separated from its hull and then dried on patios. They're, they're dried on concrete patios before they're being, then, then they're mechanically dried, and then they're just stored before being um, hulled or husked and then prepared for shipment. So how this works is there are, ten, there are 12 different farms that actually contribute to this lot, and they're from all, all in that... Um, in that Cerrado Minero growing region, which is in, in the state of Minas, Minas Gerais. I'm not really very good at Portuguese, sorry. If it, but these were all harvested about um, from July to September in 2020. And um, they contain a variety of varietals, which are Mundo Novo, Catuai Red, Catuai Yellow, Topazio, Catusai, and, and Acaya. So those are the different varietals that you'll find in here. And so these are actually, it's, it's different in Brazil than, than places where I normally buy coffee from. Brazil has very large scale production. And so this large scale production, they actually plant the, the trees in, a, in rows and they actually do it in a very particular way that allows them to do mechanical harvesting with rows. So that you can, they basically what they do is they take a modified blueberry um, harvester, which means that they've got these like plastic fingers, and as they roll down, the uh, the trees are in a line, right? The, the coffee trees are in a line, so they'll roll down, and these will, you know, shake the the, the branches, and the beans will fall off. But uh, so this this type of processing, and as you can see, when I showed you earlier, the um, the inconsistent, the the slight variations in color here, is also I think a byproduct of because of this mechanical harvesting, it's, they'll, they'll, re, they'll do a general reading of the, the cherries for um, specific gravity. So there's a certain amount of sugar content they're looking for. However, they'll just go and start to harvest from all the trees, which means that you're going to get a variety of really crimson red, red, light red, orangey, yellow, not so red, so when you're talking like red and crimson red, those are like the really, really like ripe, like the truly ripe cherries that, that in, in the processing that we normally do with our growers, they're sending their pickers out to harvest each red cherry at a time, which means that a, a picker will have to visit an individual tree seven, probably about seven times during a harvest season. Here, they may only do two or three passes for their harvest season before they've, they've raked everything off the trees. So it's, it's a little bit of a different process, but it's more for a premium coffee, and so that's why they have the, the different grading standard. All right, so let's stop talking, because that's a lot of talking about this. So how's everyone doing out there? Good to see you. Thanks for joining in. I noticed a few more jo people have been joining us. You know, let me know what you're doing, where you are. Are you smoking? Are you having a drink? Drop those in the comments. All right, so let's have a look here. We're going to... So what I'm doing is I just thought that this would be an interesting coffee to try. Um, I don't really have a, in my, in, our, in the operations of Spro, I don't really have a, a need or use for this grade of coffee. It's not a bad grade, it's just um, a different grade. A, I mean, the lower grade, of course, but a different, different, for different purposes, right? So these would be more blenders that you'd put with other coffees. And some of the Brazilians tend to be very neutral, you know, very light and neutral. So they're great for blending with other coffees to be like more of a filler, right? Kind of like, you know, how, we, how you blend cigars, I guess, you know, you put some, some tobaccos. It may not be so strong, but you want to build out for the thicker cigars so that, yeah, you know what I'm saying. All right, so to, because we're using this coffee, I thought we'd go with the, the cupping style. And so cupping is the critical way of tasting coffee in the coffee industry. So pretty much whenever, whenever anyone is really critically tasting coffee, they're going to use cupping. And cupping is, is a style of brewing your coffee is where you basically will take 
an amount of coffee, put it in a vessel, like either a glass like this, we use this, or you can use a more traditional cupping bowl. This one is from uh, Escuela de El Salvador, from the, the guys down in Salvador, which I think is a pretty one. Yeah, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty. So anyway, they're about, these are two are about the same. And what you do is you basically will put ground coffee in, add hot water, raise it, fill it to the top, and let it steep for four minutes before removing the, the floating coffee. And then you're going to taste it. And this is supposed to give you a clean representation of the coffee. And so this is really how we taste coffee critically in the industry. And I thought we'd do something similar because... A company called Rattleware, which does a lot of accessories for the coffee retail business, came up with this. This is their Rattleware Cupping Brewer. So this is a brewer that's designed to mimic the characteristics of coffee cupping, right? We used this in one of the episodes several months, a couple months ago, and I kind of forgot how to use it back then. So total disaster, total disaster. Because I really don't use, if I'm going to cup coffees, I'm actually going to use this, right? So the idea is that the, this is supposed to um, mimic this style of brewing in order to allow other people, so you can, you, can, you can share the sample from this one where, you know, people, we do share the samples in the industry from one cup, so you'll just come and take a taste. But a lot of people tend to be, you know, public people tend to be, the uninitiated tend to be a little bit squeamish about that. And especially now in COVID, yeah, you should be squeamish about that. So this will allow you to mimic this while being able to serve. So what we're going to do is we're going to, it's a pretty easy way to brew. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our brewer. We're going to, it's, it's basically hourglass shape, as you can see, with the plunger. And this plunger is really more for separating the two chambers, right? So this is the lower chamber. This is the upper chamber. We're just going to separate those two. And we're going to put coffee. Now, the way that they recommend, they recommend, um, what? They recommend 30, gram, 30 grams of coffee, 500 milliliters of water. We're not going to do that. We're going to do our normal standard, which is 24 grams of coffee. And of course, we're using this Brazilian Salmo Plus Natural, right? Our sample coffee. We're going to put that here at the bottom. And it doesn't really matter if it's, you know, level or not. And now we're going to add water, about 350 milliliters, and just pour it on top, right? We're pouring it on top. The idea is to saturate it all, and the way the shape is, it's going to saturate everything. All right, there we go. That should be the right amount. Now, the 350 is basically our normal ratio for brewing coffee, so that's 2 grams for every finished ounce, which means that we're using 2 grams to make a 12-ounce cup, so 24, I mean, we're making 24 grams to make a 12-ounce cup, which is 24 grams, right? Did I, or was that, something like that. Anyway, so when you're cupping, this part here, as, as you can see, the the coffee is now floating, right? The coffee is floating here on top, right? And as you can see, if you look closely, the sediments and the, the minor pieces are falling. They're falling and it's settling. Look at that. That's quite fascinating. Right, so that's all falling. So that's going to happen for the for the four minute period that we're going to wait. This uh, time allows you to smell. Oh, nice, pleasant coffee notes. Nothing too, maybe slight fruitiness, but nothing really heavily in any. One, one direction, a pleasant. If you have any questions, of course, please feel free to drop them in the comments. I'm happy to answer them. All right, so then as this finishes, we're going to use our cupping spoon to break the floating matter, right? So it's floating. 
right? It's floating here. So we want, so what the idea is that whether you're using a cupping, normal cupping or this, there are aromatics that are held underneath this cap of floating coffee, right? The idea for the break is to release those aromatics while you're inhaling so that you get the full effect. And this is all for aroma evaluation on your coffee. You know, every week we talk about like, you know, coffee scoring and, and all, I mean, cigar scoring and how the industry is kind of disjointed in that respect. Well, in the, in the coffee, and the reason I'm, I guess I'm harder on that is because in the coffee industry, we're very like unified across the world with our scoring and our, our, our approach to, to, um, to evaluation. So as you can see here, it, it's gotten, from just a few moments ago, it has gotten, it's still falling. Oh, I better be careful because it might fall. I might cause the whole thing to fall, but if I keep on bumping it. But as you can see, it has clarified a bit. It's still a little bit on the cloudy side. It's not to totally clear, but it's looking good. All right, I think that's, I think that's good. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna take our cupping spoon. So there are cupping spoons like this that are very, like they're, they're designed to be this kind of shape or this shape, it's a little bit, this one's a little bit flatter, but this one's silver, silver plated. You see a lot of cupping people, they, they when you go to different cupping events around the world, coffee events, or even around the country, you see cuppers and they bring their own spoons. They want to show off. That irritates me. I just, I just, like I have my own spoon. Okay, so this one I have, it's engraved with my name. Okay, I'll be honest. There's some, uh, one of the importers was kind enough to engrave my name on, on the back of the cup. Thank you, Kefa Coffee. Appreciate that. Can you see it? Can we see it? Can we see it? No, I can't see it. Anyway. But I never take these with me because, I, first of all, I'm going to lose it. What we normally use, what, or I, what I normally use, is a soup spoon. So you can use a soup spoon. It just gives you a wide, round area to, to cup. So what we're going to do is we're going to push the coffee away while we are um, inhaling through the nose. Ah, King Wan Kong 2, how's it going? Thank you very much. Oh, doing well. Hope you're doing well, too, down there in the United Kingdom. All right, well... We'll look forward to seeing you catch it up later in the week. Have a good evening. All right, so so we're going to do this, and now we're going to push down and away while inhaling, right, to try to get any kind of flavor or aromatic notes. So now here we go. Hmm. Okay, so... As you can see, it's gotten cloudy suddenly, right? Like it's really dark now because I have, you know, moved the coffee around and it's um, it's just clouding the entire thing. So what's happening now is that I got some aromatics. It's, it's more toasty. I may have gone a little bit darker on the roasting for this sample than I probably should have. But that's all right. It could be worse. All right, so there's still a bit of floating, like, scum and coffee at the top. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove that by using two spoons in unison, in tandem, to... Oh, gosh, look at that. That is just ridiculous. Okay, this is not good. Hold on, let's see. I need to stand and see this better. Okay, so there's a lot of... All right, there's a lot of coffee floating in there. We're gonna let it settle. So as you can see, it's as you can see now, it's kind of settling. Right, so we're gonna let that settle on down before we start to drink. Now, in, in a typical coffee cupping, you're going to wait a total of ten minutes from the time you started brewing the coffee until you start to taste it. Mainly because you wait the ten minutes to allow the temperature to come down to a point where you can comfortably taste the coffee plus when the coffee is really really hot it occludes you know your palate from sensing 
the flavors of the coffee and appreciate them. So it's better to let it cool down for a bit. So that's what we're gonna do, we'll let it cool down. And while we do that, we're gonna talk about our, our cigar for the week. Oh, I better move it over. Hopefully it's not gonna fall. Hopefully it's not falling. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, so the, the cigar for this week, of course, we're getting from Tobacco Leaf is part of the Amplify Black Voices um, cigar kit and that's available from Raul for 60 bucks and that includes five different cigars from five different uh, black owned cigar makers uh, cigar companies and this week we've got a, cof uh, a cigar I keep saying coffee we have a cigar from a company called Black Star Line Cigars out of Chicago Illinois and this is a company that was founded by Chicago firefighter um, Arik Wimbley Bay Wimberly Bay and he's actually a firefighter in Chicago, and he decided that he wanted to start up his own coffee cigar company with his childhood friend, Derek Bell. And this is, and they first actually started, um, I think, what, in uh, several years ago. Maybe, maybe oh, I don't know what year. I can't remember. I'm, I'm guessing now. But they started off with a, a cigar called El Milagro, which they had um, El Titan de Bronze in uh, Miami, Florida make for them. And of course, a lot of you may have heard of Titan de Bronze because that's where, um, that's where, uh, Willie Herrera got his, his, uh, he made his, made his bones. So we're going to be trying this cigar. This is the War Witch Robusto. And interesting enough, this cigar was actually named after a movie of the same name called War Witch. It's a Canadian film from 2012. And it's, it's I, I don't really understand the connection between Warwitch the movie and why Warwitch the cigar. Um, the movie was actually, uh, was actually released in 2012, directed by um, a woman named Kim Nguyen, starring Rachel, Munz Rachel Mwanza. And the idea is that the, there was a child soldier forced into a civil war that was believed to be a witch. And, you know, it... it touches on a lot of, you know, difficult subject matter because, you know, child soldiers in Africa. And they also shot it in, a, they shot it in the DRC, which is a relatively, you know, that's a, the DRC, the Dem Democratic Con Republic of Congo is, you know, it kind of goes back and forth from being calm and like to, to open war zone. Like I have a friend of mine who every time I'm in, Africa, he's always giving me the update. It's like, oh, maybe this, week, this time we can go to visit the Congo. Most years, they're like, oh, no, no, it's not a good time to go to the Congo. Like, if you're not Congolese, like one of my friends, he's Congolese. And so he's like, well, we can't. Well, he's like, I want, I want to take you to visit my country, but this year it's not safe. So, anyway, all right, so let us get into the coffee now. All right, so it's kind of fallen and settled a bit, so let us do some pouring. Now, as you can see, there's going to be a little bit of sediment, a little bit of coffee, you know, coffee floaters that are in it. Now, a lot of the floaters could be, you know, problems with the processing, like we talked about earlier. The, the, if the, the coffee isn't as ripe, it can float, which then gives you a little bit of, you know, this kind of action. The community that the coffees are, don't have the density, so they tend to be light, lightweight and float. All right, so let's take a taste using our cupping spoon. So typically we'll take it and then slurp it across the palate to, um, to mix the coffee with air, to aerate it. There's some nice, like, caramelly notes. Mm, maybe some milk chocolate's nice. Nice. Good mouthfeel. The acidity is pretty on the, the medium-low side. There's, you know, it's not a... When we talk about fruity, or when we talk about natural coffees, we tend to think fruit, and, like, some of the, my favorite naturals are very, like, very, very apparent fruit, like very f bold with strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, really kind of in your face. This is not like that. This has more of a subtle fruitiness. 
maybe like raisins, date, slightly nutty. Actually, it's improved. When I roasted this coffee the other day, I, I, I did a tasting of it just to prepare, and it's really changed quite a bit in, in just two days from the roast. So when I roasted this two days ago, it was very, like, neutral, kind of light, very much um, nutty, very nutty, not really, very nutty and neutral, not really any kind of interesting notes. These, this is, it's actually improved and is much more interesting today. And you tend to find that coffee after roasting will change its character and, and it technically improve, you know, up to, f well, usually around five to seven days after the roast. So I'm going to say that since it's changed a little bit, it should get more development in the next couple of days. All right, so now, not bad, not bad. We're going to keep drinking this. But for the moment, it's time to smoke the cigars. So where's everybody hanging out today? Drop those in the comments. Let me know what you're doing. Let me know what you're smoking. I'm really interested to know. All right, so this is the War Witch Robusto. This is a Connecticut wrapped cigar that is made by Aganorsa in, in Esteli at the Agricola Norteña factory. It's a six by 46 rob Robusto. No, 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 it's a six by 50, sorry, six by 50 with um, made, of course, in Nicaragua, like we said. It has Connecticut shade with a Nica Criollo binder, as well as Jalapa and Esteli Nicaraguan fillers. And an MSRP is for $11.99, comes in a box of 20. But this one, like I said, I got from Raul as part of the Amplify Black Voices box um, kit that had five cigars for 60 bucks. And this cigar was released in... Um, March 2020, so just over a year ago. All right, so now we're gonna to get to the cutting. Mm -hmm. Cutting. The most exciting part. Oh, oh. So that's the cut. Did I do a good job? I don't know, I don't know, let's see. Not bad, not bad, not bad, not bad, not bad. Pretty straight. Oh, part of the cap's coming off. That's all right. All right, now we're going to light. We're going to use some matches. Some matches. Some J.C. Newman 125 matches. Difficult. The, the the draw is pretty light and loose. So let me. I'm gonna go to a lighter now. I hope that doesn't portend bad tidings. I can see a little bit of burning in, in the center. I hope that doesn't mean that it's coming through the center. That would be a shame. Oh, there's a copious amount of smoke, as you can see. Mm. My goodness. Starting out pretty nice. It's got some good pepper, some good, like, Punchiness. But I did want to show you the... <coughs> so since this is based on a movie, 
I wanted to share with you the trailer from that movie because I thought it was, you know, I thought it might be interesting. Here we go. Let me know if you can't hear it. All right, all right. Hopefully that did that did that get better? I saw your, I saw your message there, Dime. Hopefully it got a little bit. Uh, I put I, when I once I saw that I punched up the, the fader. So hopefully that uh, increased the sound. How's the the microphone sound for me as well? That certainly is an interesting thing. I'm going to have to look more into that because I, I've got the, the headphones on, so really it shouldn't be hearing it at all. And when I push the fader, I mean, it looks like it's coming through on the, on the board, and it should be sending it back out. I'm going to have to look at the settings and see, because I remember last week people were saying that they couldn't hear it. All right, anyway, so that's the trailer. So it's starting off, it's starting off, you know, pretty, pretty peppery, pretty solid. It's got some white ash looking good here. So it's starting off well. Construction, construction feels really nice. Let me get these boxes out of the way here. Ah. <sighs> All right, all right. So let's see here. Now, what are we? Where are we? Um, oh, so as that, well, here's so for the last couple of weeks that we've been doing these Amplify Black Voices cigars. One of the things that I've been noting is that there's really a dearth of information on the cigar. So the cigars in the last two weeks, really difficult to find very much information at all about them. And so, you know, part of me was wondering, you know, how much of this really is, you know, on mainstream cigar media. And, you know, I do think that mainstream cigar media needs to, to be more active in, in, you know, promoting newer cigar brands, especially like some of them that have been around for a few years now, and there's still no coverage on them. However, this one's a little bit different. Black Star Line seems to have gathered some level of media attention. However, the media attention that I found is mostly from non, what I would say the non-mainstream, meaning that like smaller cigar 
review sites that aren't, you know, that aren't the major ones. And some of the major ones I would consider would be like Half Wheel, um, Cigar Aficionado, Cigar Coop. You know, a lot of those sites tend to be the ones that a lot of uh, people will turn to to learn about their cigar industry and cigar tasting notes. So let's have a look. I mean, like I was saying before, So here, here, if I, if I just, if I, like for this one, I did a simple search, Black Star Online, Warwick Robusto. So good things like Provado Provi Cigar Club, which is selling them. The Black Star Line is their own website, Stogie Press. Stogie Press did do some coverage, which is good to see. And then there were other sites like iRobusto, uh, Conehead, Cigar Sense, Cigar World did a little bit, Final Third Cigar. So on the first page, we see a lot of other alternative um, cigar review sites, which is kind of interesting that um, it's, it's a little bit disappointing that we're not seeing the big ones, but also it's interesting to see, to be exposed to other ones. Like Final Third and I Robusto have really interesting, I, I think, or Cigar Sense have really interesting ways of reviewing their cigars. I'm going to go through that in a moment, but we're going to start off with Stogie Press. And Stogie Press... Hmm. Oh, this is Black Star Line Source. Let's have a look at their website to see what they have to say. I need to find something that'll prove that I'm 21. Okay, that's not old enough. Okay, we can't get in. We can't get into their website. <laughs> All right, so very well. I'm too young. I'm too young. Oh, they're finally. All right, so let's see what they have to say. You know, so they've got, they've got quite a few, but really we're looking for Stogie Press. Stogie Press, there we are, Stogie Press. Stogie Press has, you know, they, they did a lot of, uh, they do a lot of pictures. But he did cover it. He gave it a 90. And so what does he say about the 90? It's a fine smoking journey with nice flavor transitions and delicate aroma, even though it started a bit, a tad on the harsh side. I can see maybe there's a little bit of harshness. It does start off with a lot of flavor. You know, in the first, and he doesn't really break it down like a lot of other cigar reviewers it just kind of gives us a list of of no, of notes so you know for the cold draw talking about cream fruit pepper and then his overall notes are that it's a rich and thick and chewy smoke which i think that's true it's got nice smoky nice smoke production chock full of pepper that's for sure like right now just in the beginning here that's one of the things that's spice that black pepper that's been really forward now he says, it was also harsh on the first quarter inch where we are now. I don't know if it, I don't know if I would say that it's, I guess we'll find out as we get past the quarter inch mark, whether or not I'm, I'm experiencing that as well. Then later he'll get spicy honey, pepper, coffee, uh, caramel that's toasted, floral fruit, uh, dry bright fruit, then building spice throughout the entire cigar. Mm. One thing I just remembered that I, I wanted to note, if you look at the show notes below, you'll see that I changed the dates for Mike Young's, um, not Mike Young, Michael King's appearance on the show. Michael King was supposed to appear next week on March, is that next week? No, no, two. Yeah, next week. Uh, he was supposed to appear on uh, April 29th, uh, next week, next Thursday, for to talk about the Agonorsa Leaf cigars. Unfortunately, Mike had a bit of a conflict. He's got to do an event, um, I think, in New Jersey, and he was gonna. He was actually saying, you know, I can ask the the uh, the lounge owner if I can like do the remote as well. And I said, you know, why don't we just get rescheduled to the sixth? That way, we have you know your full attention, and, and you don't have to like you know you don't have to neglect your your uh, your customers. So we're gonna move the the show to May sixth, 
So that's going to be the the Agonor Salif show. So there's still time to get in touch with Raul to get the the pack. The pack, of course, includes the Rare Leaf Reserve Robusto with the two tasting sticks. And that's for 15 bucks if you go in and pick it up from Raul personally or $23 and he'll ship it anywhere in the country. Hey, Ned, how's it going? Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, yeah, that was a good cigar. That's a, the Rare Leaf Reserve, that's a nice one. Oh, you're talking about this one. This is turning out to be very nice, spicy, good flavor, full flavor. Good amount of smoke. So another one that I found was the I Robusto. Oh, here we go. Everybody always wants you to sign up. And I Robusto's got a, you know, their their website looks pretty busy. And they're a little bit they're a little bit thin on on verbiage. But you know, he, he, they do go through the different segments, you know, the third segment. So the cold draw for them starts with leather, faint leather, fruit, citrus, tobacco. And then the first, third, citrus, cedar, nuttiness, spicy white pepper. Let me scroll down to that. Spicy white pepper, caramelly leather, toast, roasted almond with some black licorice, black dark rum, coffee, mixed berries, white pepper, and a medium to full body. I would say this is definitely closer to more full bodied rather than medium. There's a little bit of bitiness, not, not really bitiness, but there's a light sensation of the tongue, which I think could be, we could consider as acidic, you know, so some brightness there, some spinning, some citrus notes. And, you know, most of those notes that we just talked about carries over through the second and third cigars. But his final thoughts, and I, I wish these guys actually used a numbering system just so we could use for comparison. But his overall no thoughts was that this is a phenomenal cigar. Solid amount of complexity and flavors that work perfectly together, and the slow burn allows for, wealth, for a welcome lengthy experience. They, he calls it box worthy, and um, everyone should give it a try. So that's, that's really a great review. Uh, Cirillo McLean, one of my buddies, he also said that this was his favorite of the, of the cigar pack. So the cigar is smoking smoothly. We're still kind of in the first third here. All right. Is it gonna, is it gonna say, oh, there we go. So that's smoking nicely. Definitely, I'm, I, I definitely say that I get some citrusy notes now. I don't know about any cedar or white pepper. No real caramel. I think there could be something that citrusy could also be described in a with like a licorice kind of character. I'm not a big fan of black licorice, so I, I tend I don't know if that would be really a positive thing in my world, but now something I wanted to, to show you guys that I thought was interesting was um, no not that one. Where is it? Cigar Sense. Oh, Goodness. Well, let's start with Final Third. Final Third, I thought, had an interesting... They do this thing where they have a calculator. This is the Final Third Cigar Review Rating Calculator. So as you can see, it, it, this is actually the... I thought was really interesting because we always talk about, you know, doing some kind of standardization for cigar grading. And I think this is probably... Quite interesting, quite interesting, Close, closer to more what I would have in mind. A little bit different in the way they structured it, but I, I think it's a, it's a good approach. So as you can see here, they've got 15 points for appearance and construction, where they look at the wrapper, the construction, the texture. Um, I would like to, if they're going to use like one to five, I would like to see them break it down to like some kind of description to give a sense of, of what it is like, meaning that while five is, a, is the perfect score, of course, what does four mean? What does three mean? Like, for example, in, in um, coffee competition scoring that, that I oversee is we use a, a zero to six category where 
Zero means unacceptable. One is acceptable. And then two is average. Three is good. Four is very good. Five is excellent. And then six is outstanding. So, you know, the six, you give a six for something that's like, wow, you, you really don't see that normally. So, you know, what would be, I would like to see something like that just to help the reviewers pinpoint where they should be in their score. All right, so again, again, that's part, of, that's part of the reason why whenever we talk about score, and I always talk about like the descriptions, do the descriptions match the score, right? That's kind of how we like to, to think about things. So the next section is uh, 25 points total, flavor. And then there's first third, second third, final third, and then overall flavor impression. And the overall flavor impression has a, a possible 10 points. Again, if, if they broke it down to something that we can understand, like what really, what gives it that? Like the flavor, why a four, why four or five? Then there's smoking characteristics, another 25 points. Draw, burn, smoke output, as well as um, the, is it even lighting? Even lighting, is that? I'm not sure what that even means. <laughs> so when you light it, is it even? That seems like it'd be something that's more on the technique of lighting, I think. I don't know what you guys think. And then finally, of course, you can see the bottom, down at the bottom. Overall experience, 35 points. Did I enjoy the cigar? Is 17 and a half. Well, they broke it down to two categories of 17 and a half cigar. First one, did I enjoy the cigar? And then overall impression of the cigar. I, liked, I do like how they break it into whether they enjoyed or not in the overall impression. Um, so there's some objectivity as well as some subjectivity. So that should give us a total of 100 points. And out of that, Rob gives us at 89 points. So that's actually something where we find two of the this written scores, Stogie Press and Rob's final third, are within a point of each other, which is, you know, that's, that's nice to see. There's nice to see that there's some uniformity between the different... Um, scoring people and even though they're using different kind of scoring systems uh the last thing i wanted to show well, the other thing i want to show you was the cigar sense there we are let me pull that up here so cigar sense i just thought they had another another one that had an interesting approach where if you look closely here they talk about they talk about the cigar and then the second paragraph says the cigar currently fits the unique preferences of 71.4 percent of our members this is an above average percentage. And then they give a flavor wheel, a breakdown of the, of the cigar itself, you know, showing some intensities for nuts, toasted, sweet, uh, lower intensities of fruit and herb, as well as animal. Again, maybe that's that barnyard thing. That was something I was talking with uh, some other guys like, I think it's kind of strange that we talk about barnyard and manure in cigars, and that's a positive thing. Like, I would never think that <laughs> that would be positive, you know, in normal, normal circumstances. And then the mouthfeel, they're spicy, sweet, you know, creamy, oily, dry, tannic. And then towards the bottom, after they show their things, they say 87% of cigar lovers state that flavor is the most important criterion when choosing cigars. So they're, they're using some sense, of, sense of, of statistics. I'm not really sure how they're getting the 71.4. I guess they're using, maybe they say here at the bottom. Oh, yeah, here we go. This is their cigar analysis method. Let's look at their cigar analysis method. Cigar anagraphic data, which we saw above, polar charts. So I think it's interesting to, I'll have to read through that more for next week. But I think that, I, I just happened to find, I just found this because they came up on the first page because none of the other company, none of the other media sources were reviewing it. So these other, like I Robusto, uh, Final Third, and Cigar Sense, you know, got a little more exposure because they covered a cigar that everybody else isn't. So now we're moving in, we are moving into the second third. 
and it's still pretty smooth. It's still got nice flavor. There's a, some nuttiness. It's still got that light, light um, citrusiness to it. Maybe there's a little bit of coffee notes coming through now. Oh, shit, I forgot to pull it up. I got to pull the, <laughs> see better. There we are. You know, as you can see here, the band is a, is a gold band. Pretty simple band, you know. And, you know, that, that's one thing I've noticed with a lot of these um, the cigars from the Amplify Black Voices reviews, that they tend to have relatively reserved cigar bands. Like, you see a lot of these other, other brands, and they've got these very opulent and, like, intricate bands. These tend to be very simple. It's got a nice feel. There's some embossing on the on the. You can see some embossing on the band. I'm not sure exactly what it, the embossing is. I haven't really got a close look at that. So what's been going on in your lives this past week? Anything been happening? Anything interesting? Like I said, here in Baltimore, it's getting cold. And we're going to have frost warnings tonight from 2 to 6 a.m., which is uh, kind of surprising. Like I broke out, I ended up wearing pants again today. Actually, the reason I wore pants because I had to do a delivery at one of our restaurants. So <laughs> that's the only reason. And I didn't want to look wear shorts for this, this girl that I know there. <laughs> And what else is happening in the world today? So, uh, big news that, that, that everyone I'm sure has heard about from the Derek Chauvin trial. He uh, finally was convicted, and sentencing will be in June. So that's been a, a positive thing, I think, in our nation. Of course, they ended up shooting that other teenage girl for the same day, which was, I think, actually at the same time. So, uh, and of course, I guess the uh, the usual pundits at uh, Fox News are protesting against it, some kind of injustice. I don't know. I don't really pay attention to them. Oh, the weather's getting crazy. Look at Tony says, goes along with the snow we had in Pennsylvania this morning. Goodness, there was snow there. I heard there was some snow in other states, but wow, really, Pennsylvania, that's, that's terrible. Some of, my, some of my friends, they've just flew off today to Denver. Those guys that I went to, um, to Deep Creek with, they decided they wanted to go to Denver this week, this weekend. They flew off today, and we were talking just a couple days ago. They're like, oh, my God, it's supposed to snow there. Like, well, that sucks. That sucks for you, man. So what else happening in the world? New York office space has hit its lowest levels in decades, which is good, man. You know, New York, New York real estate is just way expensive. It's ridiculous. And then I was watching this guy, Louis Rossman, who does this channel on YouTube. He's this computer repair guy, and he's always, like, you know, talking about what's going on and bitching about the, uh, the cost of uh, retail, real estate, uh, retail real estate and retail rents. And... Um, you know, for, the, for most of the pandemic, he was saying that you know, if nobody's lowering their rents, there's nobody in the city, and these landlords still are trying to keep very high rents. I was like, these people are crazy. The Dow has sunk 300 points because people are worried about their taxes. Oh, and the House today passed, they passed uh, legislation that will grant statehood to Washington, D.C. Now, of course... The Senate, they've done this in the past. The, this House has approved, has, has approved statehood for Washington, D.C. in the past. However, the Senate has never done that. So if the Senate doesn't go for it, then D.C. Will, will still be a federal protectorate. I mean, I don't know what, what's going to happen. Like, I've actually never been alive when we, we've never had, a, I mean, we've always had 50 states since I was born. So... That happened 10 years before I was born, so I've never seen a state added. 
That would be kind of interesting. But like, what happens then? Now we have to add a, a, a 51st star. So does that mean I have to replace my flags? Maybe the government will give us like a flag exchange. Turn in your 50 star, star flag, we'll give you a 51. But you know me, I don't like the... I don't like the, the silk screen flags, right? Like they have those ones that they just screen with the colors. So it's really inexpensive. I like the embroidered. So I want the ones that have each color is, is sewn onto the flag. Each star is, flown on, is sewn onto the blue field. That's the one that I like. You know, a proper flag. I mean, you know, speaking of all this with Derek Chavon and, and the trial with, um, in Minneapolis, one of the things that I think is interesting is that, um, that I had some people, some of my friends were complaining about was that TV show, The Falcon and The Winter Soldier. One of them, who's, and these guys are from outside the United States. They're not actually here in America. So they don't really understand our social fabric and what's happening in our country other than what they see on like international news. But they were like, you know, what? There, there's so much about this, this other stuff. And I was like, well, you know, this is really, you know, the struggle of like Sam and his family, which is, you know, indicative of the African-American struggle in the United States is, is really, I think, apropos. And I think it's really interesting that a TV show and modern day media will take that on and like put that out there for people to like, to really kind of have to deal with, you know, that. You know, here's, and in this, in the story of the Winter Sol uh, Falcon, the Winter Soldier, of course, Sam is the Falcon, and he's known as an Avenger. He's known as someone that kind of saved the world in Infinity War and Endgame. But he goes to the bank with a whole plan to get a loan for his boat, and they deny him. And this guy's like a, a, an international hero. Like, is he not going to pay his bills? So, you know, I think that that was really an interesting part of the storyline that I think is, you know, important to show. And then even, even the, the, the other guy, Isaiah, I think his name is Isaiah, the, the, other, um, the other super soldier that they put in jail for 30 years in the story. You know, he's got this reticence of being, he has very, his reticence of being patriotic because of how his country has treated him for Gave his life for it, but this is how it was repaid. I think that's really deep and kind of important to to show. In modern media. But yeah, so. All right, so we are. Still rolling along, well into the second third. It's burning slightly off, but that could be more because I'm kind of talking and slowing down the smoke, then puffing a little bit harder, slowing down again. So I don't think it's necessarily indicative of the way that the, the construction of the cigar. So Foxconn in Wisconsin had this big deal uh, with, with, with the state several years ago during the Trump era where Trump was taught, touting that they're going to bring a new Foxconn factory to Wisconsin. They're going to build whatever they're going to build. They're going to have 18,000 jobs, and they're giving them like $8 billion in tax relief. Finally, it's come out that Foxconn is scaling back. They might build cars, electric cars. They might do something else. But maybe they'll have 7,000 jobs and they're pulling back on the tax and they're pulling back on all the, the plans. So unfortunately, the, this big hoop to do is not really happening with Foxconn. That's been in the news this week. What else has been in the news? Oh, finally, the uh, NASA showed video of the Perseverance helicopter is flying. They actually, have, they actually got it to fly, and it, it flew, and I don't know what it did. <laughs> but 
But now we have air superiority on Mars. We can now control the skies of Mars. There's no, the Chinese and I think the Russians have landed probes. And um, now we can send our helicopter to go check them out. Maybe drop some bombs on them, take them out. Actually, I was asking this one, this one girl that works for Hubble. She's actually from China. And I said, so do the people feel that you're like, you know, how do you, how do they feel about you working for the U.S.? And she was like, it's no big deal. I was like, all right, very good, very good. You know, that's one of the interesting things about having my cigar shop in Hamden is that since we're so close to Johns Hopkins, there's such an interesting flow of people that come through that are doing all kinds of interesting things in tech and biotech and, and like astronomy. Like there's a lot of astronomers that come in, people that work for Hubble, people that work for the web, you know, the people that are, well, like one person, she's actually doing like human genome mapping and like trying to figure out how they can program the genomes. So really fascinating stuff, stuff that I really don't know. Like I've looked up some of their papers because I was just interested to see what kind of work they're doing. And I've tried reading some of their, their white papers that are online and man, it is definitely beyond my level of education. So it's smoking really nicely. It's still, you know, I, I probably should slow down so that we can let it even out. But it's really enjoyable. It's an enjoyable cigar. Twelve dollars again. It's right at that edge of of you know, like putting caution in my mind about buying one. But it's pleasant. It's it's actually enjoyable. And also now I knew that, like my friends went off to Denver, and turns out that if you're going to be traveling somewhere this this uh, the next few months, you should start. You should do your, uh, if, and you need to rent a car. You should rent the car right now because, and what I was reading this week is that a lot of the car companies, the rental car companies, don't really have many cars because when the pandemic hit and everything got shut down, they had all they had a they were swamped with their cars. Right, they had filling up stadium parking lots with cars because they had so many surplus cars. So what they did, they started selling them off. Now that they've sold off, you know, enough cars to even the tide for them, as people start to travel again, they may not have enough cars. So if you're going to rent a car, you should rent them right now. Reserve your car. Also, speaking of which, renting your car makes me think that maybe I should rent a car too, is that... Um, Romacraft, I don't know if you guys saw this, Romacraft did announce this week that the Weasel Fest is on. It's going to happen May 28th, something like that, May, May 29th, something like that. The, that weekend, Memorial Day weekend, it's going to be 12 hours of food and drinking and cigars and music and should be kind of interesting. I still have my ticket from the, the, last, of, the last runaround. <clears throat> so, if you're going to go to, if you wanted to go to Weasel Fest, maybe now's the time to think about that. They're going to release the ticketing, or they're going to open ticketing, I think next week, soon, something like that. I think if you go to the website, you'll be able to see what's happening. Really, they're going to have, they're going to have, so they're having like, um, oh, a, a, a distillery that's going to be there, giving demonstrations and talks about what they what they do they're gonna have style switch barbecue there to talk about what they do as well as serve their food um, actually the big thing for me is to check out the style switch barbecue place since I don't really drink too heavily All right, here we go, here we go. Let's 
So for those of you guys that watch baseball, I don't think the Orioles are doing very well. Well, maybe the Orioles are doing about average, right? But for Baltimore people and for, I imagine, a lot of people across America, the great news is that the Yankees are off to their worst start in 30 years. So the Yankees are doing terrible, which is great. Oh, and look, speaking of Yankees from that part of the country, Rusty's here. What's going on, Rusty? How's things going up there in New Jersey? Did you get any snow? Tony got some snow in Pennsylvania. It's getting cold here. We're getting uh, frost warnings for tonight. And we're smoking the Warwich Robusto from Black Line State. Black. Oh God. <laughs> Black Star Line, which is a Chicago based uh, cigar brand. And I heard that the, the New York City bomber, subway bomber, got life today for, his, uh, for trying to set off a pipe bomb that uh, didn't really work. Evidently, he was, from what I heard on NPR, he was radicalized by online videos, and then he looked at online videos to make pipe bombs. Like, who, where are these pipe bomb videos, by the way? I, I, haven't, I haven't looked, but I mean, I'm just like, I mean, I know YouTube has everything, but does YouTube have pipe bomb videos? So this guy builds a pipe bomb and tries to detonate it, and it doesn't detonate fully. I think it detonated. It injured him somehow and kind of hurt some past some nearby people. It didn't kill anyone. But if you've got a pipe bomb on you and it blows up and it doesn't kill you, I mean, that's, that's pretty poor. Like that, who made that video? Who are these people that don't know how to make pipe bombs, making videos about how to make pipe bombs? Uh, that's probably true. That's that's part of the reason why I haven't looked up on YouTube how to build a pipe bomb. Because God knows I don't want them to think that I'm making one. To me, it just seems difficult. You're like, what, I'm going to cut the pipe and then, like, thread it? I don't have that kind of equipment. Oh, that's too much work. Plus, it gets all oily because you use the oil to, like, lubricate. Oh, forget it. Why would I do that? So we've also reached a point in the, the COVID that you now anybody can be vaccinated. So if you're, I was hearing today, if you're a resident of Baltimore City, you could just go down to the convention center or the M&T Bank Stadium and get in line and get your, and get your vaccine. I heard that we've, we've, we've vaccinated half of the people in the United States, which has been relatively easy, supposedly. And now the question is like, how are they gonna get the other half to do it, right? You know, not all of them, of course, are, are reticent to get it, but some of them are. So, you know, how do you reach out to them and make them get the COVID vaccine and, you know, get all the nanoprobes as well as the tracking software that goes along with it? Um, you know, especially if it's, if it's not going to, like my, my cell reception didn't really improve. I thought it was going to, but it didn't. I'm very disappointed. So also today, they were, they were reporting that um, there was a fatal crash with a Tesla. So something happened with the self-drive. You know, I guess the guy's just kicking back and not doing anything, and the thing crashes. Terrible. Like you actually, you see some. You've seen. I've seen some videos where, like, like earlier on though. I mean, not not now, but like a couple of years ago, where people were like driving along and man, this thing just plows into whatever is in the way. That would suck. They're also talking now about electronic skin that could monitor your health. So they want to, researchers in Japan, uh oh, researchers in Japan are have developing a lightweight, ultra thin e skin that you can stick stick to your chest area with water, like you just kind of wet your chest and it sticks, like you know that kind of. Maybe like one of those like removable tattoos, and um, it will track your vitals, and um, 
I don't know, communicate. Kind of like how the Apple Watch does when you wear it. It checks your vitals and communicates with your phone and tells tells you, your phone, and Apple when you're going to die. And other news, Kanye West is releasing his Yeezys, his, his sneakers, that are $1 million. So, you know, if you want some Yeezys from Kanye, <coughs> just fork out a million bucks and uh, you'll get them. They are, um, let's, oh, I got a picture of it here, let's show it. They look like Air Jordans. <laughs> Actually, they're kind of like black Air Jordans. One million dollars, my God. For a million bucks, I would hope that Kanye will deliver it himself and we can hang out and drink some cognac and smoke some cigars and hopefully he'll wear that outfit. That would be cool. I think that'd be very cool, actually. Also in news, the um, Atlanta's Hartsfield-Jackson Airport has been knocked off as the number one busiest airport in the world. Now it's uh, Guangzhou's Baiyun International Airport is now the busiest airport. So Guangzhou saw 43.8 million passengers in 2020. In 2020, 43.8 million, which is down from 40%. So, so 40% it dropped from 2019 to 43 million. Man, that is crazy. 43 million people flying in 2020. Do you know that the, that, okay, so here in our region, of course, we've got BWI and Dulles Airport. And Dulles, we always, I, at least I do, I think of Dulles as being the busiest airport in the area. Right? And then I was surprised a while back, I, I, I found this statistic that BWI, well, Dulles flies or transports about 22 million people a year, which is a lot, right? And you always think that Dulles is the busier, it's a bigger airport, it's got more flights going everywhere in the world. But turns out that BWI here in Baltimore does 25 million passengers a year. Now, of course, I'm sure it dropped by half of that at least this past year but still I had no idea no idea so the but according to the uh, the report that I read 10 of the busiest the top 10 busiest airports in 2020 were all in China Hartsfield did fall to um, I think the number two, but seven of the top ten are all in China. So that's really quite, quite amazing, man. And whether Chengdu, Shenzhen, Kunming, Shanghai, and Xi'an were among the top ten, as well as Beijing Capital, which is kind of a, a really grand airport. Like you, you go to Beijing Capital, and it's really like this massive, like huge. The buildings are huge, and like there's multiples of them, and, and it's like miles to get to the front entrance. And they've got these big, massive, like, red, Chinese red columns. So it looks very imperial. It's really, really an attractive, like, impressive airport for a capital city. You know, when you compare it to the United States, so like, we have D.C. Dulles is, you know, kind of that, that old school 60s kind of look to it, which is kind of cool. But, man, Beijing capital, it's really... Impressive, really, really just majestic. So we're coming along closer to our final third. There's a nice kind of actually a fruitiness, a nondescript fruitiness that's starting to develop here at the tip of my tongue. The smoke has been good. It's been it's smoked evenly. There's a nice draw on it throughout the entire cigar. It's very pleasant. So, like, we talked earlier that this is a Connecticut wrap cigar that has um, Criollo binder as well as Jalapa and Esteli fillers. And, you know, when you think of Connecticut shade wrappers, 
you think that it's going to be relatively mild. This is definitely not a relatively mild cigar. This, this is a nice medium, I'd say more full, maybe a light full cigar wrapped in a, in a Connecticut wrapper. It's definitely not what you would typically expect from a Connecticut wrapped cigar. Really quite enjoyable now. I'm thinking it's really enjoyable now. I don't know if I would say it's, like Robusta says it's phenomenal. I don't know if, it's, if I would say it's phenomenal, but it's really good. Probably for my palate, the best one so far from the Amplify Black Voices pack. So what are you guys smoking out there this week? Anything interesting? And Dice says, the first time I was in Dulles, I was disappointed because <laughs> they had had airport in, Dull in uh, Die Hard 2 that looks nothing like Dulles. It looks nothing like it. I always find it, I always find it funny to watch shows that are set in places that, that, we, that, that I know that are like, oh, that's definitely not. I was just watching, what was I watching this past week? I was watching some show recently that, that I was thinking exactly that, that was like, I know this place that they're talking about, but nothing, none of that is actually there. Or what the kind of enjoyable thing is when you watch a show, like for example, let's say like um, Captain America and the Winter Soldier. I, I just happened to be watching that earlier today, just kind of skimming through it. And like, there's that scene where they take that, uh, one, that one shield agent that's actually part of Hydra, and uh, they take, you know, it's with the Captain America and uh, Natasha and Sam, and they t they're trying to get their pump of information. They take them to the top of this building, and it's actually the top of one of the buildings in downtown Baltimore because you see the uh, the old USF and G tower, and you see the um, the first National Bank tower. And you're like, oh, that's Baltimore. That's Baltimore. Excellent. All gets exciting, you know. So Tony's throwing the PDR El Trovador Maduro Corona. How is that? What do you think about that? Is that a new one from them, El Trovador? I'm not familiar with that. Young Rock has scenes in Hawaii, but I haven't seen Young Rock. What is Young Rock about? That's an interesting. I'm not oh, that's what it was. I'm glad you said that about, about Hawaii because I watch, you know, I watch Magnum PI, and um, you know, if you if you if you ever lived in Honolulu, you see. Mag well, the nice thing about so Magnum, Magnum actually to a lesser extent than Hawaii Five O, but like when I st when Hawaii Five O started coming, man, they really make Hawaii look gorgeous. Like it's. They just choose like the most prettiest parts or just pretty pretty imagery to show and like but the the thing about like let's say Magnum, for example, is that when you know the city and you see them talking about going places they're driving, and like the they're driving and it's all the same scene, but you know the, it's so disjointed you're like, well, there's no way that could be like you see like their house is on the far side of the island on the windward side of, of Oahu, right. Like when you when you live there, you're not gonna just if your home was where they are, which is out by a place called Kualoa Ranch. So from downtown Honolulu, it probably takes forty minutes for you to drive there. And you see them, you know, they're downtown Honolulu, and then they go home to do some something, talk about something, and then they go back out, and you're like, I would never like me personally. I would never do that. Like. Even Kaneohe, which is only 15 minutes away on the, one, on the other side of the mountains from Honolulu. I, I usually stay there at my friend's house. I, I, I don't normally go. Once I go into town, I don't normally go back. Like, I wouldn't normally go back just to, like, hey, let's meet and talk for, like, 15 minutes and then go back to town. No, who does that? That's craziness. And then Tony's saying, it's, it's a revamped blend of an older cigar, and I believe the risotto is better. But it's very good. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I've heard that um, that they that they have been reblending some of their cigars. Actually, that's something I forgot to ask. Um, Abe called me the other like a couple weeks ago. They called me. I was like, "What's going on, man?" He's like, "Oh, I just called to say hello." I was like, "Where are you?" I'm in the DR. I was like, "Oh God, man, crazy." What is it? If I had a friend who, I, well, you know, that could be true. You know, in 1989 or 1988, 
one of my good friends here in, ba in Baltimore. Oh, yeah, but I'm not driving Ferrari, that's for sure. Well, I wonder if I have this, this pictures or videos. But anyway, so back in 1988, before I moved to Honolulu, um, I was always a big Magnum PI fan, always. Even with, especially with the Tom Selleck era, that, that was my thing, right? So one of my good friends back then, he was like, man, let's go to Hawaii. You've been to Hawaii, let's go to Hawaii. I was like, well, all right, let's go to Hawaii. So we went to Hawaii for like a week. And I was like, dude, we're gonna rent a car. We're gonna rent that Ferrari. They had Ferraris for rent. They had the 308 Quattro Volvoli for rent at the, in Waikiki at this exotic car rental shop. It was kind of beat up because it's a car rental place. And yeah, yeah, we took that out and I drove that. <laughs> we did drive that all day. It was pretty crazy. That's the only time I ever, like, well, that's not the only time, but that was one of the big times I rented a, a Ferrari. Actually, what we did, so the old Robin's Nest estate is in a town called Waimanalo, also on the windward side. And um, it's in a, it's a place called Pahonu, which is uh, the name of a sea turtle. <coughs> really pretty estate, and <coughs> if you recall the opening scene of Magna P.I., he comes out of the garage, I mean, he comes out of the gate, crosses the street, and then does a peel out from the grass. <laughs> well, since I had my friend with me, we had a video camera. We actually shot that kind of, we recreated that scene and shot it. And I have a video somewhere on, my, on like a, like a high eight videotape somewhere. I gotta find it. If I can find it one day, I will, I will certainly show you guys. Yes, yes, they did tore, tear that down re re recently. Within the last couple of years, which was kind of sad, it's an old Spanish colonial, uh, not colonial, but Spanish-style home. Really quite pretty. And actually, the interesting thing is that Robin's Nest, the house that, that Magnum lived in, the guest house, is actually the gatehouse for the real estate. And, like, the way they make it look in the show is that, like, it's next, it's, like, next to the main mansion. It's actually, you know, spread apart by, you know, maybe, like, 200 yards. So you don't really, like you would never see, the, so the way that they depict him as walking back and forth, it doesn't really happen. But you can't access, and the one nice thing about Hawaii is that all beaches are public beaches, so you can't really restrict access. I mean, they do, a lot of these rich people do. But you can't prevent, you can't kick people out of it. You can't stop them from going to the, to the beach in front of your house. So one day, after, this is actually when I was in college there, we went to the, we went to Waimanalo. There's actually a, a small park just uh, maybe about 100 meters down the beach. So parked there and then waded through the, the tidal pool, well, waded through the, the ocean to the tidal pool the, where you see, you know, like in the opening scene, you see Magnum, you know, uh, holding the girl that's like learning how to snorkel and her butt showing. So I did go to that beach. So we got, did get to stay there and see the... Uh, Robin's Nest Estate from the beach side. It was kind of cool, you know. If, if you're a Magnum fan, you're all like, oh, this is cool. But, you know, crimes again. <laughs> for sure, for sure. And then this new one, actually, the interesting thing I found is that the new one is in a, when you look at the, the, when you look at the wide shot in the new Magnum PI of Robin's Nest, it's right there, right in front of Kulo Ranch. Actually, there's a, it's a Kulo Regional Park. That's where it is. And it's actually in the same spot where, if you ever saw that Drew Barrymore movie, Fifty First Dates with Adam Sandler, where that diner was supposed to be, it's actually in the same spot. And there's no house where Robin's Nest is. And it took me a while to really figure it out, but like that whole wide shot of the estate is actually all CGI. There is nothing like that there. So you can look on Google Maps, or yeah, if you look on Google Maps and you go to a cool little regional park, that's where Robin's Nest today is, and there is nothing there. So it's really, that was really kind of interesting. So here we are, we're going on into the final third. It's still smoking, but look at that. Now, remember we saw that green last week? We saw a little bit of, that, there's that green again. Is that just a coloration? Actually, it doesn't look so green in person. It looks more green here on the screen. That's not really green.
So they had a big Apple event, was it yesterday? Where they announced a whole bunch of new stuff. They have the new iMacs that are 11 millimeters thin on the side bezel. And then they come in all these different colors. Some people think they're kind of garish. Yeah, yeah, let me hear Paul. I'll pull it up here so you guys can see it. Or maybe we can't see it. Let's see. Oh, yeah, there we are. So these are the new iMacs with the M1 pro processors, which is actually really interesting. Like, I don't know if you follow, if you guys follow much against this Apple stuff, but this whole M1 with this, what they call ARM architecture, <coughs> is just, I mean, I, I'm, I kind of want to say it's revolutionary because it's so, like, it goes so fast. Like, the processing speed of, like, I got the, the M1 Mac Mini, right? That's what I'm running the show on, but for the money like the m1 mac mini is like 700 dollars, and the performance that i'm getting out of it is you know blowing away like or matching you know machines that are like 10 times the price so it's really been quite it's really quite interesting and, and it makes me interesting to see what's going to happen and this new architecture is evidently the same architecture that's being used in the iphone so i haven't tried this myself because i'm not really a big fan of the iphone applications right that iOS stuff, I'm not really a big fan of that stuff. So, but this new M1 processors will, they say can, you can download the iPhone apps and you run them on your lap, on your desktop, laptop. So I think that's kind of interesting. Like there's no real apps that I want to, that are gonna do that. So they also release these AirTags, which are trackers. And I guess you put them in whatever you want, your, your wallet, your bag, your whatever, and you can track your you can track it if you but then you know does that mean apple tracks you oh, i don't know there's a new remote some people that are really into the remotes of apple are really liking this one i don't use the apple remote so i don't really know purple iphone yeah so you know that kind of thing you know if you're an apple person this could be exciting if you're not definitely not exciting But I get into discussions online with uh, people that are in the editing. So I, I use the, the M1, the Mac Mini, really for video editing. And the, 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 the processing speed for these new machines are really, really incredible. And like, you know, I, like today, we're just talking to people, and they're like, well, you know, it can do all that, but it can't do some of this. You know, like some of the 6K, 8K kind of editing and, and rendering and, and that kind of thing. Or, or the like one guy was saying he, he took like a 6K file with a heavy grading and a bunch of other effects where his machine, his Windows-based machine, could do it to render the whole project in like, I don't know, 25 minutes or something like that. It took two days for the M1, his M1, to do it. And I was like, well, then, yes, that's, I think for heavy-duty application, it's not going to be. But, for example, you're spending, you know, $7,000 on your machine. I would hope that a $7,000 machine would blow the pants off a $700 machine. That only makes sense. Like, I would be upset if, if it didn't, you know. Or if I had spent that kind of money. And I won't spend that kind of money. All right, so this has kind of gone out, maybe because I'm slowing down and talking, so I've squeezed up. I made the mistake just now of squeezing it. So I'm going to relight. Really like because it's quite enjoyable. And I'm also getting to that, that point in the cigar where it, it's short enough that I'm, you know, starting to inhale it and that makes me irritated. There's something about the shorter length of a cigar that causes me to inhale more, which kind of makes me want to gag. For me, cigar smoking is also enjoyment of the smoke, but also kind of running away from the smoke. So since I pushed the cherry out by mistake, well, unwisely, it's, now I have to light it. It's much more difficult to relight. I think that's it.
So the coffee's doing well. This again, we're talking about the Brazil, New York number two three, Salmo plus natural. It's got nice like date notes, some raisin, a decent amount of body, which goes well with it's going well with the cigar. I'm enjoying it. Which brings us up to the question, the weekly question that we're always asking. Would I buy it again? I think I would. I think I would. I, I would be, like, like as, as I always say, you know, if, if it was at $10 or under, I'd be very enthusiastic about it. But at $12, it's, you know, it's still, it's still in that price point where I'm like, ugh. In other cigar news, there's this new cigar that just came out. And for a friend of mine out in Honolulu, he's got, he runs a place called um, Arfield Winery, which is a gourmet wines and foods and all kinds of stuff. And um, they do cigars, do a lot of cigars. Marvin Chang, he's got this place. And he works with um, some different coffee, uh, cigar companies to make limited release cigars for the Hawaii market. And a few years back, they came out with the, maybe it's back 2011, 2012, they came out with this thing called the T110, which was really punchy and heavy for the time that it was released. It's not so punchy and heavy compared to like a lot of the releases over the last 10 years. Um, but they came out with the Redux. So he uh, got Pete Johnson from Tatawai to re-release it and make another version of it. And um, unfortunately, they're all sold out. Um, maybe you can give them a call at, at, at the place and see if they might have any better... I think they're all sold out, but the, from what my friends who have them, they're saying they're, it's as good as the original release. So that's, that's a nice thing to see. Is this box worthy? Hmm, that's a good question. Twenty boxes at twelve dollars. So two hundred forty dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if if. Yeah, it's, I guess it's worth it. At least a five pack. Let's see a five pack. Let's see a five pack. It's, it's definitely worth, it's definitely worth checking out. More so, I'd, I'd say more so than, than maybe the last two. Actually, last week we had a, we had a good response to the last one. So have you guys smoked anything good this week? I didn't really smoke too much this week. I had, a, um, of course, I had my Revenges. I had a couple of Revenges this past week. Always a good cigar. That's very box worthy, at least in my book. Um, and I also smoked a couple more of the uh, Stolen Thrones. Um, what's it called? Stolen Thrones, um, Crook of the Crown Robusto. That's really a pleasing, a heavy, and that's something like, I guess like the T110, you know, a lot of the cigars now that come out, we've tried. I would say the Revenge is part of that. Most of the Roma Craft, um, the, the Stolen Thrones, and a, quite a number of the other cigars, they definitely are much heavier, bolder flavored, good balance. But speaking of the PDR that you were talking about, Tony, I mean, I, I still have some of those Maduro SP54s. I'll probably only have like two or three left. Uh, those are quite good too. Oh, nice. My favorite black label, Cazadores. Yes, those are fantastic. Those are really, really lovely. I remember when they first came out with the, uh, the black melamine jar. Oh, man, those were really great. The Toro shape, or was it the Bellicoso shape? For me, at least, I think in the Tatawai line, I would say that my favorite of all the Tatawai so far has been the um, the original release of the the Kohonu, which is I think they call now the 2003 Kohonu, 2004 Kohonu. I think that t still today that cigar is really, really great. And then I like the um, that Bellicosa shaped uh, black label reserve that you're talking about. I think that's 
I think those are my two favorite Tatawais of all time. Didn't they re-release the Tran Fedor? I believe that that's that's correct, right? A couple years ago, I think they re-released that again. So it's still smoking well. Coming down to the end. It's kind of heavy now on me. Hmm. Oh, Inting, hello, how's it going? Good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, La Mission is, yeah, the La Mission is really nice. They had this one, was it, what's the one, the Avion? The Avion, that's not, that's not, La, that's not the La Mission. But the, the remember the La, the La Avion, I think it was, released in 2011? I think that was really a fantastic one. And then Tony says, yes, it did. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, if I remember correctly, that's one of your favorites too, right? So if you're just tuning in, we're smoking the Black Star Line, Wall Ridge Robusto. And uh, Black Star Line is this Chicago-based uh, brand from two good friends, from child, two childhood friends. One of them is a uh, firefighter in uh, Chicago, this guy named Arik. Wimberly Bay and his uh, childhood friend Derek Bell and um, they started like I said before they started out with a, a line called El Milagro that they that they made with Sandy Cobas of uh, El Titan de Bronze in Miami and now they moved on to this line which came out about a year ago that's made for them by Agonorsa in um, Esteli oh and also like I said and you might have missed this earlier um, I did move the, we had to move the Agonorsa, the rare leaf Agonor, the rare leaf reserve Agonorsa tasting, from next Thursday to May six. So it's going to happen two weeks from now. Um, Mike had had a little bit of a conflict with a, an event that was happening in his territory that he had to do, and rather than trying to <clears throat> convince his customer, the the owner of the lounge, to split time with him with the with the pot with the live stream, I just thought let's move it to the six. That way you get that way you don't have to compromise with your customer. So there's another two weeks to go for the, uh, to get the, um, the Rare Leaf Reserve pack from Raul that's going to have the Rare Leaf Reserve Robusto as well as two of the leaf tasting sticks that we're going to talk about with Mike on the show. So you've got a couple more weeks to get that, so make sure you give Raul a call. It's $15 for the pack, $23 shipped anywhere in the country. And Tony says, the El Chufundro Lancera is the one I smoke a lot, but the black label comes to, oh, yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. Ooh, so what's going on this weekend? Anything happening? My godson, Dodd's die son, is getting his uh, confirmation on Saturday. So I'll be down in, uh, what, Gaithersburg Road, too? We got to be there pretty early, like 9.45, which means I probably have to get up at 6 <laughs> so that I can be ready and showered and drive down there. So it, it's kind of, I'm, I'm fighting a little bit to stay alive. Oh, in Kensington, okay. Yeah, Kensington, Gaithersburg. From my perspective, it's all kind of the same. It's getting a little bit harsher now. A little more bitters, a little bit more burning on the tongue. The 
coffee is still going well with it. Like I said earlier, this is the, um, it's a little bit different coffee than we normally use. It's actually a sample of um, what we call a New York 2-3, which is more of a premium, premium level coffee. So it's a little bit of a lower grade than I normally use for, for Spro. But I thought it'd be an interesting thing just for us to try, just, just for something different. So Stogie Press in their review said that this cigar is not for the meek and that it will light you up. And I gotta say, you know, now, especially now that we're towards the end, it's definitely got a lot more punch, a lot more force. So it's definitely like, I definitely feel it more. What's... <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good question. What should I take? That's a, that's a question. What should we bring? Question is, is, is dad up for a smoke? Let's get a little more of this coffee here. <laughs> you guys know me too well. You guys know me too well now. Actually, I think I'm down to my last one in this box. Where is it? Oh, I'm down to the last two. The last two intemperances. What will I do now? Cry, probably. Cry is a good one. Maybe Mike and Skip will see this and take pity on me and send me some more. <coughs> All right, it's definitely starting to split a bit. Yeah, there it is. It's getting a little bit loose. Oh, it's burning me as well. So right now, and oh, it's kind of fell apart a little bit, as you can see. It's to that point where the draw is the draw is difficult, so I have to kind of pinch the end here to get that compression so that there's a so there's that nice um, so it gets that right draw. All right, that's enough. That's enough. No more fighting. Oh, so that was the Black Star Line War Witch Robusto. A nice cigar, enjoyable. I think it did have nice notes of cocoa, some coffee, some um, citrusiness to it, like a little bit of acidity on the, on the tongue, you know, especially to the first, the early part of the cigar, mid part of the cigar. Um, the force and the, the, the strength definitely built, especially at the very end. Um, a lot of good smoke, copious smoking, nice draw throughout the entire cigar until right at the end just now. And um, so really enjoyable, actually, I thought. Um, what else is there to say? So, yeah, like I said, the Aganor Salif is going to be moved from next week to the six or so two weeks away. So get that pack. I think it'll be a really fun time. Mike's going to be on the show for that. And, um, yeah, I guess that's about it. Thanks for tuning in. I really appreciate you spending another Thursday night with me here. It's getting kind of chilly outside, so hopefully by next week we'll have some nicer weather. Um, I don't know what else there to say. I guess that's about it. Thank you for tuning in. Really appreciate you spending the time with me. And uh, see you next time.